Yeah. So now moving on to the Beaver. <laughs> now the Beaver is uh, the third film directed by Jodie Foster, and uh, the first two were Little Man Tate, which I loved, Home for the Holidays, which was good, and this one is uh, quite the challenge, as it turns out. It was written by a guy from USC named Kyle Killen. Now, this is a script that topped the blacklist. Now, if you don't know what the blacklist is, the blacklist is an internally circulated list amongst industry folks of the top 10 on best unproduced screenplays in Hollywood. And every year there's a new blacklist, and this film, uh, this script, The Beaver, was on that blacklist, and it attracted not only uh, Jodie Foster as director, she appears in the film too, but surprisingly, it also attracted Mel Gibson. Now Gibson plays Walter, who is a, a toy company executive. This guy's on the skids. He's estranged from his wife, uh, his job's a disaster. Guy is an alcoholic. He's hated by his, his older son, who wants nothing to do with him. In fact, Walter, when we meet him, he's in a hotel room. He's about to kill himself. He can't even do that right. And what he does when he can't kill himself, he walks back to his car, and in the garbage can, in a, in a, in a big uh, garbage bin, he finds a hand puppet in the shape of a beaver. He puts the hand puppet on, and <laughs> Corey, Corey loves it already. He puts the hand puppet on, and then he starts... The beaver starts talking. It starts talking through Walter. And the beaver is giving Walter instructions. The beaver is essentially saying to Walter, get your act together. And the best way to get your act together is to blow up everything you were before you met me and become something totally new. Now, we'll look at a clip and you'll see why the film is very difficult to pull off and only does it a little bit. Hello, the person who handed you this card is under the care of a prescription puppet. Walter, what the hell is this? Uh, Henry, mate. Let's see if we can find that varnish we was talking about. I'll get it. Thanks, mate. Did you read the card? Yes, I... Read the card. I... Read the card. The person who handed you this card is under the care of a prescription puppet. Designed to help create a psychological distance between himself and the negative aspects of his personality. Please treat him as you normally would, but address yourself to the puppet. Thank you. There you go. Is this some kind of a joke? Oh, hardly, love. Nothing funny about it. Stop it with the puppet. Right? I, I'm confused, Walter, and I, I need some answers right now. As you can see there, which is quite surprising, the movie is not played for laughs. There's a little, what F Foster has an impossible task, which is there's a balancing act between comedy and drama where she wants to ease you into it with very light laughs and a, a score that starts bouncy. But she's really doing that to sort of indoctrinate you into what she's attempting, which is to make this film pretty serious. And the, the thing is, is that it gets darker as it goes along, and I appreciate that, but it never really gets all that insightful in terms of what Walter is going through. And you've really got to give it up uh, to Mel Gibson. And I watched this film as best I could, not caring about Mel Gibson's past and the, and the cops and all that sort of stuff. I really try to sit there and I, I, I try to just to watch it as it is. And Gibson is terrific. He's just, he's emotionally dead. He's channeling something, and ultimately, he gives the character, I think, more than the character gives him. And somehow, and I don't know, maybe it was due to uh, the problems he was going through, he really takes it seriously. Uh, Foster is always putting Walter and the Beaver in the same shot, so you, 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 always, you always understand that it's, that it's Walter speaking through the Beaver. And my issue with it is that Gibson is so good that you wish there was more emotionally for us to grab onto, and there really isn't. Gibson has a very complicated, Walter has a very complicated relationship with his son, who's played by Ant, uh, Anton Yelchin, who played, uh, who played Chekhov in, the, in uh, the recent Star Trek film. And uh, Yeltsin plays the older son, who uh, hates his father so much that he actually writes post-it notes with characteristics of his father that he wants to, like, never emulate. 
and he's got dozens of these post-it notes on his wall. And Yeltsin plays a character who writes term papers for other students for money because the Yeltsin character is so good being able to put himself into the, into the minds of other students. That's why he's so good at writing term papers and speeches, but yet, a little cheesy, but yet he can, he, can put his, he, can put his, he can put himself into the minds of other people, but yet he can't really delve into his own mind, his own psyche. He's such a blank because he hates his father so much. So that's a little cheesy. I think that the film ultimately fails on an emotional level, but it's so unique and provocative that you almost have to respect the attempt. I think Lars and the Real Girl attempted something similar and did it a little bit better only because it had more empathy and was less emotionally coy. And that's why if you had to choose between The Beaver and Lars and the Real Girl, I would go with Lars and the Real Girl. But The Beaver is a very interesting failure. And <laughs> on that level, <coughs> on, on that level, I would give it a rent. And it's funny because afterwards the publicist emailed me the next day and said, what did you think? And I said, quite frankly, it, on an emotional level, it really does fail, but it fails in such a unique, provocative, and sincere fashion that I would almost recommend it. And Mel Gibson's terrific. Jodie Foster is okay. Uh, it's well shot. Uh, the score is pretty good. You know, there's some pretty crappy songs in it, which is kind of annoying. Uh, so, uh, but ultimately, uh, ultimately, ultimately, what's going to happen is you'll you'll appreciate the effort but you won't get much out of it because whatever Walter goes through is really a uh, gimmick, very sincerely dramatized gimmick, but it winds up just being gimmick and doesn't really resonate. So that's my problem with so the beaver. He gives it a so, rent. So I'm giving it a rent. Now, you soundtrack wise, you love soundtracks. What do you mean that you said it was bad, crappy? What, what uh, that the mean? problem is that it's not that the score is bad. The problem is that the songs that they pick, I, I, I didn't like. They're a little on the nose. Huh? What, what, like there, what? It's, you know what? It, it's the type of songs where the lyrics are very on the nose regarding uh, what the characters are thinking. He's and got you, a puppet on and, his head. Well, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's like it's that emotionally what they're going through. His puppet's name is Beaver. <laughs> that's weird. Wait, you saw the movie? I, that's weird. It's unbelievable. <laughs> that's a nice uh, song, yeah, though, Mike. I like your, I like your vo vocal stylings. Notice I cracked on purpose. It was almost like an alfalfa kind of thing. Like, I'm, I can sing, but I did it on purpose. Comedy. I look like a Peter Brady. And Brady, by the way, Brady. as opposed to the score for Thor, which is by Patrick Doyle, who's a very talented English composer, very good, very good. You know why? Because Branagh and Doyle worked together on all those uh, Shakespeare movies. Anyway, so I would give uh, The Beaver a rent. All right. There you go.